Hi, everyone. If I could have your attention, um, my name is Chris Babbitts. I'm one of the faculty co-directors at Berkman Klein. I'm so happy to see all of you here today for this great talk. Um, administrative housekeeping, as some of you know, if you've been here before, we live stream and record these events. So just keep that in mind if and when you answer a uh, ask a question later, as, you, as we hope you will. We'll try and save some room uh, at the end for questions. I was just saying to Rashida that we've been trying to get her up here to do a talk for a while, so I'm so happy that it's finally happened. Some of you may know we have our own AI ethics and governance uh, program at the Berkman Klein Center working with the MIT Media Lab, and we are such huge fans of the work that Rashida and her colleagues at AI Now uh, are doing. Uh, Rashida's the, Rashida Richardson is the director of policy research there and is gonna be talking to us about uh, a new paper, uh, Dirty Data, Bad Predictions, How Civil Rights Violations Impact Police Data, Predictive Policing Systems, and Society. Um, I'm gonna turn things over quickly to Rashida, and again, we'll save some time at the end for questions. So, Rashida, please come up, thanks. Thanks, Chris, and I'm really excited to be here, even though it did take a while. Um, so, Instead of, the, one I'll say I won't bore you because this is a really interesting talk and I'm not simply saying that to toot my own horn. Um, but this, I am just going to warn you that it's going to start off a little interactive. So I'm going to play a video and then try to solicit some responses from you and then you listen. So. <laughs> Okay, so what are some observations from that video? This is where you can shout things out, or, or actually you can say them in the mic <laughs> so it picks up in the recording. Any, anyone, thoughts, observations from the video while I get the presentation up? I would have liked to have seen a comparison with other minority groups. Anyone else? Oh, go. Back there, and then over here, and then I guess we'll stop. Okay. There, there's a person right back there. My first, my first um, response is, it's 2019, haven't we learned these lessons already? It was sort of notable just how simple the response was, just the sort of typical, we need to do this to uh, prevent crime in these high crime areas. There wasn't sort of any broader justification or defense of the practice from the LAPD. Thank you for, I guess, humoring me <laughs> by engaging. So I'm going to sort of highlight two major observations or obvious points that were came through in the video, which will help frame some of the discussion for now. Oh, it's not in play mode, sorry. Okay. Um, and the first, which the gentleman back there kind of harped on, is the sort of sad side of this in that 
many US police departments continue to and have historically engaged in discriminatory police practices and policies and police are increasingly turning to technological solutions for a range of issues, ranging from resource allocation to trying to identify less discriminatory ways to um, sort of contain public saf safety or address crime. And for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to unpack those two phenomena and as a way of framing the larger discussion. And then I'm going to go into some of the research that I did, which was the foundation for a forthcoming law review, which will be out, I think, next week in NYU's Law Review Online, um, which looked at dirty data and predictive policing, and then some of the key observations, findings, and a little bit of hope for the future. Um, so when I say the US, that US law enforcement has a problem with discriminatory police practices and policies, this can include unconstitutional stops and frisk policies that either encourage or result in disproportionate targeting of people of color, other const unconstitutional practices like using a person's perceived race or citizenship status as a pretext for a stop, arrest, or search, um, straight up corruption, which can include covering up crimes where officers may be implicated or planting evidence on innocent people. Juking the stats, which is sort of a twofold phenomena. It's both inflating or deflating individual or aggregate crime data um, that fits certain policy priorities. So if you want certain violent crimes to appear as if they're going down, this may result in police trying to encourage victims to not report a crime or actually downgrading the crime in the official reports. Or alternatively, it can mean inflating the amount of small property crimes in order to justify increased policing in certain communities or to even justify the acquisition of police technologies to target those problems. And at the same time, police are increasingly turning to technology as an easier, quick solution to address concerns rather than adopting systemic overhauls. And this can include surveillance technologies like cell site simulators, which is in the top left corner, um, automatic, automated license plate readers, which is those little cameras in the middle, um, and biometric technologies, that little green thing is a finger uh, print scanner. And then, um, and, and they adopt these technologies increasingly to help investigate crimes. And they're also turning to tasers, which is in the sort of middle, it looks like a gun, but it's not, um, and body-worn cameras to address concerns like unlawful use of force and accountability measures. And then predictive policing, which is the technology I'll be focusing on for the remainder of this talk, is used to help with resource allocation and anticipating crime or predicting where it may occur. And there are two types of predicting, pre, uh, predictive policing technologies. You have place space, which is in the vertical image there, and, those, and that type of system tries to predict where a crime may occur in a specific geographic region in a given window of time. And then you have person-based systems, and you'll see this sort of horizontal image that's a network, and that is an example of a person-based predictive policing system which attempts to identify who may be a victim or a perpetrator of a crime. And both systems rely on vast amounts of law enforcement data to make predictions, and some also use non-law enforcement related data like weather, location of liquor stores, and other factors that the companies have decided affect cr criminal activity. So while this may seem like a fairly innocuous way to use and address crime and public safety issues on its face, it's important to understand this technology in the context in which it's being used. Dirty data is a term commonly used in the dating mining community to refer to missing data, wrong data, or non-standard representations of data. And here and in the law review that the findings and other analysis are in, we expand this term so that dirty data includes a new category which reflects the culture of data production and policing. Currently, there are no national, state, or local standards on the creation or organization of police data, so it often reflects the environment and priorities of the police departments in the communities where the data is collected, organized, and used. So when I use the term dirty data throughout this talk and in the paper, it includes, but is not limited to, aggregate crime data generated from stops, searches, and arrests of innocent people that rep misrepresents the prevalence of crime in certain communities, data reflecting falsified records and planted evidence, 
skewed data on calls for service and incident reports that reflect false claims of criminal activity, systemic ma manipulation of criminal statistics to promote a particular public relations funding or political outcome, and errors in inputting the data like misspellings and wrong numbers. And, is, and it is important to note that data can also be subject to multiple forms of manipulation and subjective judgments at once, which makes it difficult, if not impossible, for systems trained on the data, like predictive policing, to separate or even detect the good data from the bad or dirty data. And this point is notable because some of the most prominent of policing companies, and here I have sort of clips from the two most prominent, Hunch Lab and Predpol, um, assume that these problems of dirty data can be isolated and mitigated through classical mathematical, technical, and statistical techniques. And the concern with dirty data is particularly, con or, or particularly problematic when used in pr policing technologies because of what's known as the bias in, bias out phenomena of predictive systems. And this means that the outcomes predicted by these technologies will most likely reflect the biases embedded in the data. So if a specific community is disproportionately targeted by unlawful and discriminatory police practices and therefore overrepresented in the underlying police data, this means the predictive system will most likely assume or predict that this community requires greater police scrutiny. And with this concern in mind and others, I examined 13 jurisdictions that are using, previously used, or are developing predictive policing systems while being subject to government investigations, consent decrees, and other federally adjudicated settlements that have shown that the, the departments have engaged in corrupt, discriminatory, or otherwise illegal police practices. And these jurisdictions include Baltimore, Maryland, Boston, Massachusetts, Chicago, Illinois, Ferguson, Missouri, Miami, Florida, Maricopa County, Arizona, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, New Orleans, Louisiana, New York, New York, Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Seattle, Washington, and Suffolk County, New York. It's kind of tiring listing all of those. But. Um, and for this research, I compared the police data, practices, and policies for these um, that came from the investigations or litigation with publicly available information regarding the jurisdiction's use of predictive policing systems to assess the levels of risk that the dirty data would affect the use or predictions made by these systems. And the analysis revealed that nine jurisdictions implemented predictive policing systems that were used, that used police data that was generated during the periods where the departments were found to have engaged in unlawful and biased police practices. And this high risks that the dirty data was used or trained to implement these systems. And in some cases, we observed that the systems, predict, the systems predictions directly reflected the legacies of discriminatory policing in those departments. And I've highlighted Chicago as an example because there they use a, a person-based predictive policing system known as the st strategic subjects list that attempted to identify individuals most likely to be a victim or a perpetrator perpetrator of a shooting-related crime. And a significant portion of the individuals labeled as high risk on that list had never been arrested or shot. And the predominant majority of the list was young black men, which is the same exact demographic that was disproportionately targeted by over 50 years of the Chicago police's discriminatory police practices. And in some cases, there was torture. The other four jurisdictions were less conclusive due to a lack of available public information uh, on the predictive policing systems or pertinent government policies like data sharing between jurisdictions and overlapping ju jurisdictions. And here I've highlighted Maricopa County where you may be familiar with their top official, Sheriff Arpaio, who was recently, okay, you got it. Uh, <laughs> I can tell by the hmm. Uh, <laughs> where under his direction of the department, they engaged in a range of discriminatory police practices and unlawful enforcement of immigration laws. And in fact, the department was subject to several court orders prohibiting such practices, and eventually many officials from that office were held in contempt for continuing to violate the court orders um, for about eight years, actually. It was kind of insane. Um, and the sheriff's office not only performed law enforcement duties for the county, but they also performed um, law enforcement duties for many of the towns and cities within its jurisdiction who lacked police resources or didn't have adequate police resources. And there, um, there were four cities within the county that used predictive policing, but the reason our finding was inconclusive is because there was 
though there was evidence of data sharing with the sheriff's office, there were no clear or at least publicly posted data sharing policies between the departments. So it was, we were unable to fully assess whether the level of risk of using the county's dirty data po or the level of risk that it posed for the use of these predictive policing systems um, using the sheriff county's data. Earlier I mentioned the self-perpetuating phenomena of bias in and bias out, where you, it, which is generally understood as a feedback loop, and I'll be referring to that for the remainder of the talk. And there's already research that shows that the mathematical models of these predictive policing systems are susceptible to what are called runaway feedback loops, where police are repeatedly sent back to the same neighborhoods regardless of the actual crime rate. And this research showed that, and in, in, in the research that I did, we showed that feedback loops are also attributed to biased police data as well as societal bias. First, let's examine the problems with police data. Police data is embedded with many flaws, but two particular problems are of concern regarding the use of predictive policing systems. The first is that police practices, policies, and priorities do not necessarily reflect the actual prevalence or occurrence rates of crimes. And often police data omits essential information about um, that is pertinent to police practices and policies by eliminating certain types of crime and certain types of criminal. For example, most local police departments and predictive policing systems traditionally focus on violent street property and quality of life crimes and offenses, whereas white collar crimes, which are, compar are comparatively under investigated and overlooked in crime reporting. And despite evidence of a strong probability that those crimes occur at a greater frequency than the aforementioned categories combined. I focus on these specific problems of bias in police data because the confluence of these two specific problems skew the inputs into predictive policing systems and ultimately produce a data-driven justification for increased policing and surveillance of traditionally marginalized or over-policed communities and reinforces popular misconceptions regarding the crimin criminality and safety of underrepresented criminals and communities. And these broader societal implications is why this type of feedback loop is so pernicious. When people observe increased police presence and contacts in marginalized communities, it can reinforce unwarranted assumptions and stereotypes. In fact, continued exposure and reinforcement of these types of stereotypes, especially in the absence of a counter narrative, can allow society to maintain a prejudice against marginalized groups while still maintaining an explicit commitment to egalitarianism. And this complex yet contradictory sentiments can incite responses that perpetuate this feedback loop. For example, observing racially biased police practices can reinforce racial animus and false stereotypes of violence and criminality racial and ethnic groups, which can result in improper calls for oh, sorry, um, improper calls for service for non-criminal activity that is perceived or um, that is perceived as suspicious or causes discomfort. And this was popularly um, documented by the media and in memes with Permit Patty and Barbecue Becky and the many other names of white women that have called the police on black people in the past year for innocuous behavior. And a recent study, um, which this graph comes from, um, on, the on gentrification in 311 data that looked at the 311 call for service data and found that lower income communities of color that experienced a large influx of white and affluent residents experienced a significantly higher increase of quality of life complaints and summons were three times as more likely than neighborhoods without a large influx of white affluent residents. And these societal is particularly concerning um, because they provide more opportunities for police discretion and selective enforcement, which further distorts police data. And I posit that these incidents of, uh, the incidents of negative outcomes for marginalized communities are more likely to occur in communities where police are disconnected from or not part of the communities that they're policing, and New York and Philly are examples of cities that have these problems. The feedback loop can also influence broader public policy by driving and providing justification and policies that attempt to manage or push out communities that are producing problems, increasing disorder. For example, 
And a specific example of this outcome are nuisance laws and ordinances, which empower municipal governments to penalize individuals and communities for a certain number of calls for service or nuisance conduct, which is an ill-defined category that ranges from assault to littering, depending on the jurisdiction. And a recent ACLU report found that these policies disproportionately affect poor communities of color because they amplify the harms of the criminal justice system and exacerbate socioeconomic and racial inequalities by making housing instability a consequence of law enforcement. In examining these specific jurisdictions and highlighting important concerns regarding the scope of dirty data, I have a few observations. The first is that there are few political and institutional incentives that encourage self-monitoring, ongoing auditing of data systems, or reform, and reforms that do not restrict or prohibit the use of dirty data or require some level of a systemic overhaul of data collection, organization, analysis, and use practices will not address the problems that I've discussed today. Though there is one encouraging development that happened in the LAPD recently, where their police chief has announced that, that they're no longer going to use person-based predictive police systems and is revising the use of their place-based predictive policing systems because of concerns of dirty data, the lack of oversight and implementation, and overall questions about the effectiveness of these systems. And this came after the LAPD inspector general did a um, deep research and wrote a 60-page report kind of outlining many of the same problems that we found in this research. Second, there needs to be restrictions and prohibitions or complete overhauls on the use of dirty data. And this is also necessary because problematic uses of dirty data are not limited to law enforcement or even um, the specific police departments where the data was generated from. And Maricopa County and Baltimore are two examples from the jurisdictions that I research where the lack of clear public policies about data sharing between police departments and where the jurisdictional boundaries of police departments were blurred, we weren't able to conclude whether the dirty data in fact was a high, um, created a high risk when using um, the predictive policing systems in those departments. And also, police data is used at many other decision points in the criminal justice system, um, from prosecution, pretrial services, adjudication, sentencing, corrections, and other non-criminal justice-related political decisions. So there is a heightened concern that dirty data can further corrupt decision-making throughout the criminal justice system, and this is something that I'm actively researching. Finally, now more than ever, there's also a need for an empowered, independent authority to assess and address dirty data issues within policing and the government more broadly. The jurisdictions that were researched were subject to highly publicized investigations and lawsuits, but these are, it, but these crucial mechanisms for uncovering and addressing problematic policing, uh, problematic policing practices have been threatening by the par parting acts of the former U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Before he left office, he sent around a DOJ policy memo significantly limiting the use of consent decrees by requiring top officials sign off limiting the scope and duration of the consent decrees and requiring department attorneys to provide more evidence than, or they had to provide evidence of um, problematic violations beyond unconstitutional behavior, which can mean that many of the police departments engaging in discriminatory and unconstitutional practices can continue, their practices can continue to go unchecked. So though the majority of this talk I've spent spent time critiquing dirty data and its consequences, I want to be clear that data is still an important tool for advocacy, policy making, and governance, because in its absence, we do not understand the full scope of issues, and important decisions will rely on more subjective factors like intuition. But it's also important to recognize that data is not ahistorical or apolitical. And I believe this research shows the consequences of failing to understand that point. And if we don't interrogate the context in which that data is collected and used, we're also bound to use data in ways that perpetuate the bias and corruption that is embedded there within, even in the most noble use cases. If we want technology and data-driven processes to have a net benefit for all in society, then we need to make sure that a broad mix of stakeholders in, are meaningfully engaged early and have frank conversations about the methods, logic, and goals of these systems and processes in order to ensure that fairness, equity, and justice are reflected in the outcomes. Thanks. <laughs>
Thank you so much. This is really compelling stuff. And I want to ask you a question that follows from your, from your last point, a question about method. Mm -hmm. Because it seems pretty clear as you go through this that we do need to understand more about the context in which data is collected, but how do you do that? Like, what is, what is the method? Can we use ethnography? Do we, you know, how, how do we go about finding out um, and from whom? Well, I think in this context for policing, ethnographic studies would be helpful, but part of the problem is that police officers and other law enforcement officials are not data scientists, and often this data is not being collected or originally intended for the use cases like predictive policing or other uses in technologies. So I think there just needs to be a wholesale sort of systemic review of the process. Um, some of the, so the, I, I think I didn't say this specifically, but it's a split of the jurisdictions that I studied. Half of them were sort of DOJ investigations and consent decrees, and then the other half um, were federally adjudicated settlements. So one example, actually two examples, is here in Boston and in New York City where stop and frisk policies were challenged, and it, most of them were actually ACLU cases that brought the challenges. But um, in most of the DOJ consent decrees, I think, Half of them were DOJ consent decrees, and only one of them actually required any type of reform of the data practices or ongoing audits. So I think it's also that we need to change how we're thinking about reform and that it's not simply just practices and policies, but looking at where those practices and policies um, information is sort of embedded or where the reach can, sorry, <laughs> um, where that they can sort of corrupt other parts of policing. And I think that's where through those, like that's one mechanism, but obviously, like I stated early on, that litigation is not the best method for trying to both uncover and sort of address these problems. So I think it needs to be both, in that if there are jurisdictions that are currently under reform, looking at the data practices, organization, and use needs to be one significant part of the reform efforts. But then I think there needs to be some type of empowered independent authority that forces some level of scrutiny or I guess just inquiry into police departments and how they are collecting the data, using it, and organizing. Which type of system is more vulnerable to the dirty data problem, the place-based or the person-based? So there's some scholars that, the person-based is problematic in that essentially you're making judgments about an individual based on aggregate data, so I think most people hear of how a person-based system applies and it's just like on its face it doesn't sound right. And I think some scholars kind of only focus on person-based systems because it, on its face. I one of your slides from a company that says, we only do place-based. Yeah, so the, the reason why I'm, I'm harping on like the, a lot of the research is focused on person-based, but I don't think that place-based systems are sort of immune from problems, and in fact, PredPol, which is one of the prominent companies, constantly is trying to fight off claims of bias because they're like, we're place-based, we're only using crime data location and time. But the fact that we don't have national or even local standards around police data, one of the first questions I wanted to ask of a PredPol person is, how are you even defining crime? Because that's usually dictated by state criminal code, varies by each state, and if you have sort of an off-the-shelf system that's supposed to be applied nationally, not understanding that just even how you're categorizing crime may vary um, by jurisdiction, then you're failing to understand the nuances of that application. And in fact, um, in the LAPD study that I mentioned at the end, they used PredPol and found that there were certain skews in the outcomes of that system, so that's partially why play space is completely off the table in LA, in, for LAPD, but they're sort of looking into play space because there are ways you could possibly try to segregate the dirty data or even implement the system in a more fair way, um, but I don't think at all that it's immune, and I think both systems need to be scrutinized equally. There's a question in the back. Is it possible that place-based data um, is fundamentally problematic in the sense that you can never, um, I guess, and, or just, I guess the question, or the, the data itself is problematic in the police system in the sense that it's actually a more refined version of like prior assumptions and that mm -hmm. actually the question is abolishing 
the use of data and implementing more egalitarian practices? Um, yes. <laughs> I, so, like, that's part of the reason why I go into the feedback loops issue and also, one, because I think we, this isn't isolated to policing and just, I think one of the problems in this country is we see policing as a problem of a few bad apples creating a problem in a police department and not as a broader, as policing as a reflection of broader societal problems. So, even with the place-based data and the reason why I focused on the, like, 311 study is there a lot of these, um, the, specifically Hunch Lab and PredPol have said they tried to use 311 call for service data to kind of counteract bias that could be in other data points. But to me, the obvious point was, well, call for service data is not like immune from bias either. And it's also not an accurate reflection of actual crime. And this may be because I'm a New Yorker that lives in one of the most gentrified neighborhoods. So this was like a point that hit home for me where I, like I've, one sort of anecdote that I'll give is where I live, there is um, a like festival at some time of the year, and my favorite part of the summer is you see still drum bands practicing in a parking lot, and they just practice during the week. And over the past two years, there's this one white resident <laughs> that has started to call the police on the steel drum band. Um, and now it's gotten to the point where the police are like, can you stop calling us because we're not going to go and report that. But that's because the police have an understanding of the history of this neighborhood or the context in which the noise complaint is coming from and have enough sort of context to realize that it's a falsified call for service. But if you're in a department where people don't understand the context of the communities or there's a heightened sense of concern about certain communities where regardless of interrogating the substance of the claim, you just go, you can see how that will also skew the data. So it's, I kind of have in the mind that there's no point of police data that isn't embedded with some level of bias or some type of subjective and discretionary judgment. So that's why I think there needs to be a wholesale review and that data can be used in strategic ways, but we're not collecting data for public safety. We're collecting data for over-policing criminalization of certain communities. So I think we just need to reorient everything and start from the biggest, or start from scratch. And then I think that's how you can get to more holistic solutions, like maybe you should send a social worker instead of a police officer to certain situations. And then. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, police departments that use in-house developed tools as opposed to proprietary tools and if it makes any difference with regard to dirty data problem? Um, they're all kind of the same. Most police departments buy what I would say is off-the-shelf systems, so PredPol, HunchLab, IBM, Motorola, like they all make di different systems and some, and Crimescape is another one. Some police departments um, and some of these tools can be tailored for certain interests. So some systems um, can specifically only focus on robberies or a specific type of crime that they're trying to address. And in Chicago, there, because they have a terrible gun issue, is why they were focusing on shooting-related crimes. Um, but they're both sort of susceptible to the same issues in that it's all um, stemming back from what type of data are you using, as well as like what is the ultimate goal of these systems, because I have had some people raise like, well, can you use this type of system to target interventions or for some type of good use? But Chicago is a great example in that that system was originally implemented where they wanted to warn people that they were either a victim or a perpetrator of a crime, but often even the good intention type of systems are implemented in punitive ways. So in Chicago, the way we even know about the strategic subjects list is because um, the police started to go to people's doors and say, like, you're on a list, and without any context, like, people were like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Like, does that mean I'm going to be, like, scrutinized more? And then there was a small note in the directive that created the strategic subjects list that said if a person is subsequently arrested after being sort of notified that they're on the list, the prosecutor should seek the highest charges. So if we're actually trying to, like, reduce crime or at least warn people about risk of harm, I think there's more productive ways to do it than to sort of ambiguously tell someone they're on a list and then like sort of heighten the charges against them, especially since a lot of the times when people are re-arrested, it's for like probation violations of like you were out 10 minutes past your time. So I think it's, yeah, I've said enough. <laughs> I kind of ramble, so. <laughs> <laughs>
of here. Yeah, could you give us a sense for how much these systems cost, like how much taxpayer money is being poured into them and then how profitable these companies are? So I don't have an actual number in part because some it's the, the business model for some of these companies is like I think Predpol, um, which is a place-based predictive system, may cost around like two hundred thousand dollars, but that doesn't include maintenance fees, service fees, um, server fees for warehousing the data, and then some systems also outsource, so they'll require you to get um, an Amazon account for storing the data or Google visualizations account to actually map the visualization. So it's kind of hard to nail down the net um, cost, but it's kind of a mix of like what is the concern to um, taxpayers because the acquisition of these technologies and a lot of surveillance technologies is fairly opaque. So sometimes um, I think about half of the um, systems on my list of 13 were funded through DOJ grants at some point. So often the DOJ will give a grant for a pilot and then the city or town will choose to continue using it and then that's where, where it would affect um, tax dollars. But one of the concerns I've raised with some legislators in Washington is only one example, which was actually Boston, has there ever been a retrospective study of the efficacy of the program? And in the Boston program, they found it wasn't useful. And similar to LAPD, when you do any type of review, it's hard to say that these systems are, like a lot of the times, the police departments will have some type of quote in a newspaper saying like, crime is down and we're using Predpol. But when you're using multiple types of systems to target crime, how can you really isolate one system as the cause for crime being down? But also crime could be down for a lot of reasons that I mentioned before of like systemic manipulation um, of crime statistics. And in fact, there's been tons of research on CompStat and how that's been manipulated and that's just a data analysis tool. Um, so in short, it's costing money, we just don't know how much. And we also don't know how prevalent the use is. And I think one of the concerning things that I found in this research is the lack of public information on these systems. And luckily, like for a few of the ACLU cases, because I used to work there, I was able to call up the attorneys. And I was like, hey, I saw the police chief said this about predictive policing. They went to some predictive policing conference, but I can't find any other documentation about use. And it's really concerning that that's my only way of finding information when the public should know whether or not their police department is spending funds for something that in the few jurisdictions they have done some level of review and have found to not be very effective and, and at least perpetuates harm. Yes? I've been in the midst of uh, creating a curriculum for identifying uh, bias in machine learning and, and remedying it and uh, came across um, uh, uh, Judge Garrity's ruling back from the 70s here in Boston uh, that led to busing students uh, to desegregate. And uh, it said uh, uh, that uh, de facto, uh, uh, de facto um, um, uh, was determined to be a pattern. And th this is, the whole, all the technology behind this is just pattern matching. Mm -hmm. And couldn't, couldn't this be a lever to get more transparency into the police data. I mean, they, there's no good side to this. In fact, I, I think the companies that are doing it are absolutely un unethical because they don't have enough data. Mm -hmm. And they, they, it's not that they don't have clean data, they don't have enough data. Uh, so the only good thing that can co come out, out of this, I, I think, is transparency. Yeah, so that's actually a concern that I've raised a lot of the time in that there's a severe asymmetry in policy priorities and that I can't even list off the amount of predictive policing uses in the United States, but we know that there's been a lot and it's increasing. But there's only one pilot study I can point to where police data has been used to target a problem that we know exists in policing, which is misconduct. And that's an ongoing pilot being done by the University of Chicago. It's only in three police departments. I don't know when it will be done, but it's looking at um, police officers who may be more likely to have an adverse interaction with a resident. And that, I think, shows you the problem in that, yes, police data can be used to find, identify problems even within police departments, but that's not the priority or even goal of a lot of police departments or even in the adoption of such technology. So I think that's sort of why I keep saying we need a wholesale sort of overhaul of thinking about these systems and also changing how we think about public safety and that there's tons of research that shows if there's greater community trust in police, that 
crime may go down, or at least people feel um, more comfortable uh, coming forth in like either giving evidence to a crime or reporting crime, and that can improve public safety. But when you have opaque systems that produce bad outcomes and people don't really feel engaged, I think it's going to create greater tension in certain communities. Um, and it also, one of the problems is like, there's no training, to my understanding, from these companies and the jurisdictions using. So I give the Chicago example in part because it's funny. Um, but it's also very illustrative of the problem in that you give police a printout and say crime may occur in this area at a certain time but you don't tell them what to do with the data or you don't give them any type of context, then you're more likely to create a more hostile situation between residents. So I think it's both a data and like systems problem, but also it goes back to training and policy in that if you want to try to use those systems in an effective way, you probably should give more context to the officers who are about to engage in the community using the system. And I don't think like training would help solve the problems with predictive policing, and I agree with you that the systems, I think the vendors are also unethical. Um, but I think we just need to start ha having conversations like this and changing how we think about the use of technology and government in solving problems. Back there and over there. Um, so some, somewhat of a, uh, a, a segue from the gentleman's question, I actually had a similar question. So like, do you, do you see any way in which, maybe not necessarily from the data that the police are collecting, but how like others, maybe watchdog groups, uh, you know, nonprofits, such and so forth, uh, researchers collect their, like their own data to, um, I mean, I guess in kind of simple terms, like police, the police, um, cause I'm, I'm from Chicago, so I do privy to some of these things going on. Um, one of the things that they started implementing, I think last year was actually they read uh, the, the installing license readers um, on the police cars. And so, um, and again, this might be like a, you know, the, 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 the master's tools can't dismantle the master's house type thing. Um, I'm actually not sure how much I believe. <laughs> if I, I, no, I, they, they probably can, but, <laughs> um, but, um, I'm just kind of wondering if there were, you know, for example, let's say you like also installed install like, you know, a timer in a police car and actually recorded data of like how long they're stopping people. And then you could cross reference that with, you know, the race section, what, you know, whatever mm -hmm. to show that they're stopping, you know, black people longer. I mean, not, is, is there any kind of ways? Yeah, that this is why I ended with the point because I, I realize how I come off sometimes, and I don't want to suggest that data in itself is bad. There are many good uses of data. I think, in part, this is a transparency problem in that not everyone is getting access to the same amount of data. And in fact, the non-DOJ jurisdictions that I researched, how we even found out the scope of the problematic police problems was a result of litigation that required some level of data. So um, I'll go back to New York, because that's my hometown. Um, but there, it was there were it was kind of a series of three cases that led to what is known as the Floyd litigation, which is the big stop and frisk case. But there, there were multiple cases where they just had to get data to even understand the scope of the problem. And then, after receiving a few decades of NYPD data, is when they saw that oh, they're disproportionately um, targeting black and brown communities and specific commun like communities in the outer boroughs. So it's. Yes, data is useful, and I think there it can be useful for a lot of advocacy purposes, but it's kind of a double-edged sword in that the d data itself is not always being collected for these reasons, so it takes a lot of effort and sort of analysis to figure out the right ways to make certain arguments. But um, there are some projects. I know in Chicago there's the Invisible Institute, which is trying to take police data to identify problems and also help with advocacy efforts in New York City. Um, there's a legal aid society project that's um, related to the gang database, which is encouraging residents to do um, what is the state version of FOIA um, on themselves to find out if they're part of the database to help, help build a sort of public database to understand the problem. So there's a lot of work and advocacy that can come from the use of data and strategic ways to collect data to help reform police. But we're not quite there yet, and it's like you, I think you kind of have to start from the beginning and sort of examining the methodology that things are being collected in and also the environment that it's being collected in and that 
I know I said it earlier, but like police are not data scientists. So they're just going and doing what they're told or even reporting to whatever their self-interest or precinct interest is, but not necessarily with the goal of aggregate data being used in some way. Hi. Thanks for this interesting talk. Um, I've got a comment and a question. Um, here in Cambridge, we have Shot Spotter, which is um, that was in one of the images, but right, I didn't yes, call it. yes, um, which I found fascinating because by no objective measure do we have a gun problem. Um, so I started pulling on that thread and discovered it was a DOJ grant, um, so we weren't paying for it. Um, at least at first. And then I started pulling on the DOJ grant problem and discovered that um, it wasn't that the DOJ decided this was a good idea. ShotSpotter itself had gone to Washington to the House Appropriations Committee, got a grant program established through Congress to buy their own software, and then offered pre-sale support to cities you know, to come to Washington, meet the grant makers, and teach them how to write a successful grant for the money um, that ShotSpotter had gotten the taxpayers to appropriate, mm -hmm. which is basically as, a, as corrupt a feedback loop as you can find. It was just, it's astonishing. And I'm, I'm not sure why ShotSpotter is, still exists. It's, you know, more white collar crime that goes unreported. Um, but, um, um, my question is this, are there police role models or police, you know, predict, predictive policing that you think are actually worth examining because they're good? Are there any sort of best practices actually being used around the nation? Or is, for the most part, all this stuff problematic? No, it's all problematic. <laughs> But I, but I do want to make a point about shot spotter, which kind of connects with your question about the cost to taxpayers, and that I recently learned that shot spotter is very expensive. And one of the problems with shot spotter is the cost actually incentivizes more discriminatory uses. So they end up putting shot spotter in traditionally over police communities, even though that may not reflect where gun crime may occur, or there may not even be a gun crime issue, but it just becomes a, another tool to add to the surveillance of certain communities. So that is to try to need the needle thread the needle. Um, the, that is one of the concerns too, is that the cost may incentivize police departments to deploy, to deploy technologies in even more problematic ways. Um, but no, I think part of the concern is lobbying by a lot of these companies, specifically Predpol. I only know one example where they tried to get Arizona State to pass a law and it went through the both chambers of the legislature and was only vetoed by the governor. I from our research, it's mostly because we think he's a new governor and was trying to be like fiscally responsible. So like, thank goodness for governance issues. Um, but there, um, they essentially would have gotten Arizona State to fund multiple pilots of their system, but it was under the guise of border security, which also was a huge question mark of like, that, that's not really, like if you go on your website, it says what you're doing, so how can you say this is for border security? So, I th and then um, another thing we were trying to understand is that there's these like third parties that kind of go to police departments. They're kind of like a marketing team that is separate from these companies that go around saying like, oh, you have this problem, this is a way to solve it. Um, and then they help like set up pilots or set up actual contracts. So I think there's a lot of unethical lobbying that's happening, which fuels the use of these systems, but also results in their implementation not being very thoughtful, where they're just saying like, oh, we got this new tool. It's no, we won't spend time trying to think up a policy about how to actually train officers in using this information because it's free, and then maybe we won't use it, maybe we will. So there's just like a lot of sort of concentric issues going on at once, which I think incentivize improper behavior and use of technology. So something we all know is that change takes time. And I, you mentioned earlier is that we identified the problem, which is clear, and then you broke down the problem for us today. But I guess my question is, what's like the ETA on predictive policing being gone? So like, who do I need to vote for so this 
decision gets fixed. Because I feel like we, we all know the problem, but we don't know how to, like, we all, we're all in here like, okay, we got to fix this. But, well, I can't fix it personally, but I know someone out there can. So what should I do to help as, like, an eight-year-old me, I guess? Huh. Uh, well, the problem is I don't think it's that easy of a solution because, so I think the first step, and I kind of said this at the end, is that there needs to be a broader conversation about the use of these technologies up front. Um, one thing that we've, AI Now, we wrote an algorithmic impact assessment report last year, which looks at government use of AI-related systems and tries to build on the history of environmental, human, rights and privacy impact statements in that it would force an agency to actually assess the outcomes and impact of its use of the system, open it up to scrutiny from researchers, and actually have a conversation with the community where they intend to use these technologies to assess, like, is this the best way to solve public safety concerns? And I think, I often say this crassly, if you asked anyone in most of these communities if once you describe what predictive policing is, if that's the best tool to solve a certain problem, most people would say no. Um, and there are more effective and probably lower cost ways to address problems. So I think it needs, we need to open up the conversation about the use of technology and government more broadly and engage more of the communities where these technologies are deployed, but also a variety of stakeholders, because what I often find with predictive policing is they're created in highly technical environments, so it's most, like PredPol was created by a UCLA math professor and a bunch of other mathematicians, and that's not to dig at the math departments, but it's, it's more that you have very complicated social issues where people who don't have a background or even understanding of those problems are applying a technical solution without understanding the social context. And then in the police department, you only have law enforcement officials making decisions about whether this is the best use case and no one else from the other side of the criminal justice system or even from the communities are part of those conversations. So, and I think if you even had like one defense attorney <laughs> in any of these conversations, they would raise a few flags about use. So I think the first step is one, acknowledging the problem and having broader conversations about it. And then I think we, there needs to be localized solutions in that I don't think a federal moratorium on the use of predictive policing is necessarily going to solve the problem because then it will just shift to some other type of technological use. And it also doesn't address the problem of dirty data within police departments and the fact that that data is already used um, in many different ways within police departments and more broadly in the criminal justice system. Um, so I know that's not a helpful answer and it's also not giving you an ETA, but because change is slow, it, you, I think if you want equitable solutions that actually benefits everyone, it needs to be a conversation that's not made or decisions that are made by a handful um, of a few people who most likely will not be affected by those systems. And I don't think there are easy solutions either. Like the reason why policing has been a problem since the founding of this country is because we haven't quite figured it out. And I don't think we're going to figure out either a technical or other solution, but we do need to start engaging others to try to figure out what is the best way to solve these problems. Or maybe like we, I take more of a realist view, so this is maybe a negative way to end it, but we can accept that certain problems may not ever be addressed, but we can try to find ways to mitigate and improve the life and like safety of certain communities that are negatively harmed. Over here. Oh, oh, over here and then there. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more just about the research process, mm -hmm. trying to get information about all of these departments. Did you have, and you sort of talked a little bit about how hard it was to find information. Mm -hmm. Did you file a bunch of public records requests? Were they successful? Were they just denied? Like what sort of strategies did you find uh, so to work? So a lot of the information, at least on the police practices and policies is public and that's so, it was a lot of reading, a lot of reading about really messed up stuff. Um, so it was reading the DOJ investigations and supplemental reports, all court filings and documents related to the litigations. Um, it was more the predictive policing part was hard and part of the methodology of this research is I didn't want to do, and I only wanted public information but I also have been a lawyer for a while and done public records requests and know how long that stuff takes. So I also knew that I wasn't going to get the information I wanted in the any period of time. I could have filed this last summer and still not have had information. 
And part of the reason I wanted to focus on what was publicly available is because all of this information should be open and available to the community, to the public generally, but especially to the communities where these technologies are being used. And it's even more of a concern when you can't find information. In Arizona, it was actually odd because there were a few media reports, but then I don't know if it's because like media is having a downward turn, but like some of the articles just disappeared over time. Um, and it was hard, and like I did look through public records and for contracts of some of the systems. Um, some systems I found out about through studies. So I think uh, Baltimore maybe was one of the examples where the only acknowledgement that the count, Baltimore County was using a predictive policing system was because there was one study, which I was able to find because I'm part of a university system that had access to like um, research journals, but there was one study that was on the use of that system. And that's also concerning because shouldn't people within that county have some level of understanding of what's being used and it not only being um, sort of limited to the research community. So, it was mostly publicly available documents. Most of the information was public. If anything, it, it was just information about the actual use of the systems or which systems were being used was the hardest to find. And I, like I, if someone wanted to replicate this or even expand it beyond just DOJ consent decrees and um, federally adjudicated settlements in um, certain jurisdictions, I think doing public records re requests would help, but I don't necessarily think that it would end in a fruitful production of documents <laughs> that one would want. But I encourage you guys, if you're interested in doing it, it just takes a while or years. <laughs> Um, so you talked about the need for conversations with stakeholders, and I was just wondering um, if you could give some examples of who you think those stakeholders should be and what that conversation or what that process might look like. So the process I was describing before could be part of a procurement process that most municipalities already have in place. So, And it should definitely happen before you buy something <laughs> because one of the advantages to having a more broader conversation is you can identify problems that could presumably be fixed or put into the contract with a vendor. Um, but who the stakeholder should be, um, you could have people who were affected by the criminal justice system and that's either people from communities that have been over-policed or someone who's actually been to prison, criminal defense attorneys and other advocates for individuals in the criminal justice system, and people who, police officers, police officials, inspector generals, and not every municipality has one, but that's usually an independent body that has oversight and some level of accountability authority over police departments. But I think it needs to be balanced because I find in most law enforcement related conversations, it's usually only law enforcement related people. Um, so it's only police chiefs and prosecutors, but not anyone else. So I think that, and I also think just people within a community, because I don't necessarily think you need to have had a negative impact from the criminal justice system to have an opinion on how you think your community should be policed. Thanks.